Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Gary Polano, Managing Editor of Fruit Growers News. Today's webinar is brought to us by Onset. We'll have two experts speak about crop and pest modeling. Our speakers today are Dan Olmsted and Matt Sharp. Dan Olmsted of Cornell University's NUA organization coordinates the development of real-time insect pest and plant disease risk assessment models and tools throughout the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Upper Midwest United States. He maintains and promotes the NUA, which is a collection of over 680 on-farm weather stations. Matt customizes data logging solutions for researchers and growers through his role as an agricultural and environmental application specialist at Onset. After they've completed the presentation portion, we'll open it up for questions. This webinar will be available on demand as well. Look out for an email that will let you know when it is available. Feel free to utilize the text box feature in the bottom left corner of your screen to submit any questions you have while Dan and Matt are speaking. If we can't get to all of the questions, they will reach out to you after the webinar is over with your answers. Now it's on with the show. Great. Thank you, Gary. This is Dan Olmsted speaking. Next slide. As Gary mentioned, I am an extension associate with the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program, which is part of uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension at Cornell University. So we have a land grant mission here in New York. Um, I've been on board since 2017 in my role as NUA coordinator, and uh, I hope to provide some useful information to you today. Um, as everybody has mentioned, we can answer questions afterwards. So let's keep going. Uh, next slide, please. So there's going to be a few poll questions in this uh, seminar. So if you want to go ahead and answer that, uh, we will proceed. Um, and so the first question is, have you heard of NUA? Uh, I think based on our participants, um, it'll be interesting to see the results. I believe we're going to leave this open uh, for just a minute or so here while people have a chance to respond. Okay, maybe we can move to the next slide at this point. Great. Okay, so about 75% of people online today have actually heard of NUA, so that's great. About 30% of you have not. So what I'm going to do is try and tailor my talk a little bit to this uh, makeup of the audience, and we'll go from there. Next slide, please. So to give you a little bit of an introduction about NUA, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar and for those who maybe haven't checked in in a little while, um, we are um, a collaboration of many different states and grower organizations. Uh, we started out way back in the early 90s uh, as a very small program within New York. And again, because I'm part of Cornell University, we had a land grant mission to support our local growers here. Um, NUA uh, started out with maybe 15 stations and over time has grown uh, to include almost 700 physical machines uh, distributed throughout the Northeast, Upper Midwest, and Mid-Atlantic states. And most recently, I'm happy to say, uh, we have made a huge jump out west uh, to Utah. Uh, I think a lot of our Apple tools, which I'll talk about uh, over the next few slides, have been a primary driver of this. Uh, and so um, when you put all these things together, uh, we get to a point where we want to work with Onset uh, to provide uh, as many of these options as possible to people who can use this information to make sound IPM decisions. Um, a couple of other things I'll point out. On the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see two different colors. Green states are member states. So every one of those locations has a NUA state coordinator. And again, at the end of the presentation, I'll have a complete listing of all the contact information if you're interested in learning more in your region. We also have blue states. So blue states are those in which we have independent growers or perhaps there's one or two 
uh, stations um, that have indicated an interest in participating uh, but aren't uh, involved at that state level. And again, there's uh, different benefits uh, to each of those, which I'll get to in a couple of slides. The one other thing I want to point out here is that um, we do track our users as best as possible just to help us make decisions uh, with web design and with outreach efforts. And you can see that from 2017, uh, actually this was uh, in December of just this past year. So from 2017 to 2019, we had 80,000 unique visitors and that's based on IP address. So there could be some uh, people in there who are accessing from both a laptop and maybe a smart device, for example, but that's a, ver that's a significant number of people. Um, and again, the idea is uh, to provide the type of support which I'll, I'll be describing in just a moment. Uh, next slide, please. So I would like to talk a little bit more about um, exactly what NUA is, how it fits within the larger context of what we do here at Cornell University, and then ultimately um, how we collaborate and partner with uh, all of those other states I just showed you. So um, at its core, NUA supports IPM. Uh, we can define this as the, the, the sustainable management of pests using methods that minimize environmental health and economic risks. So this can include topics such as plant disease epidemiology, insect phenology, plant phenology, and crop management. Um, in terms of actual models and tools that we have on NUA uh, for these purposes, there are 15 plant disease forecast tools, uh, 11 insect uh, development tools, three crop management tools, which focus uh, really in apple production, and then we have 11 degree day tools. And so, Newest purpose really comes down to the idea of combining all of these separate areas that by themselves have important value, um, but by bringing them together, it adds something more. And so what we're really doing uh, in the context of pulling in weather data is converting environmental parameters into biological risk indicators. Now on the right hand side, I have just uh, a few of our, our key collaborators here. There's a really big list, um, but at the top, NUA is part of the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. Um, we partner closely here at Cornell University with the Northeast Regional Climate Center. They do all of our programming and uh, uh, they handle the technical side of onboarding all of our weather stations. If there's something wrong, uh, I work closely with them uh, to resolve these issues. Um, and so again, New York State Integrated Pest Management is part of Cornell Cooperative Extension at Cornell University, and we're receiving a fair amount of funding from USDA um, in terms of a website rebuild that will relaunch in November. Uh, next slide, please. I want to touch really quickly on why NUA has grown, um, and I think this is a really important aspect uh, to, to cover in a webinar like this. Um, as I mentioned, back in the 90s, NUA started out as you know, something uh, very small within New York State. Um, but since that time, um, there have been a lot of people who make this effort possible. And um, the, the idea that NUA can have a real impacts both economically um, and from an IPM perspective is not lost on people. And so this is what's really driving NUA's growth. Um, I certainly am not out there um, actively saying, hey, you need to join NUA because it's the best thing in the world. What's really happening is that growers are talking to their regional extension people or one of our colleagues, uh, for example, in the Northeast when things really started to take off, um, our Northeast colleagues said, you know, what you're doing is really useful. Is there a way for us to um, work together to also provide this service uh, to our growers. And so that's what's happened. Um, it's a very uh, organic, so to speak, process, and we're trying to do everything we can uh, to stay true to our core mission of supporting New York growers while also extending and telescoping our effect into all these other states. And, and again, if you think about the map that I just showed you, we're really starting to see um, that effect play out. And actually my hiring in 2017 was also part of this um, period of growth. So on the left hand side to talk about specific impacts, uh, we did a 2017 survey uh, among current NUA users. I think the number of respondents in total was 
somewhere between 350 and 380. So within those, um, there was a subset of primarily apple and grape growers who we said on an annual basis, um, what kind of savings do you see? And so uh, we see $4,300 on average uh, from reducing sprays. We see $33,000 in avoided crop loss Again, this is within apples and grapes, so we have a slightly higher value commodity, uh, but nonetheless important. And then everything, all things considered on a per acre basis, um, this was a really interesting question. What do you estimate your savings are on an annual basis? So that worked out to about $2,000. Um, so the point is there are economic impacts uh, to pursuing this approach. We always say never use NUA in isolation. You know, as an as an IPM practitioner, you should always be finding as many information sources as possible. But by combining real-time weather data collection with farm-scale measurements, uh, my feeling is that this really increases the confidence uh, that a grower can have uh, as they are making uh, those important management decisions, especially when there's uh, a large economic uh, consequence, positive or negative, on the line. Um, and so the middle slide, I'll just point out very quickly that uh, in that same survey, we, when we asked these questions, you can see, by and large, um, almost everybody said they agree with these statements. Um, and this has been consistent over time. There was actually a 2007 survey that my predecessor, Dr. Julie Carroll here, the, the state fruit IPM coordinator with NYS IPM did back in 2007, and we, ha we saw the same results. So NUA was smaller, but the results are consistent, and so that's very encouraging. Uh, next slide, please. So to get back to this idea that NUA um, is a combination of factors, uh, you know, at first glance, NUA looks like a website, but it's really so much more than a website. Um, and what I've kind of pinpointed in the first few years that I've been in this position is that there are probably seven distinct areas that by themselves, if we think about agriculture and technology and decision making, they're all important on their own. Um, but I include this diagram now whenever I talk to folks because it's really a synergy, and I'm not using this in a jargony sense. I'm using this in a literal sense because if you combine all of these separate factors that I have up here on the slide, software, hardware, you know, what are the inputs, uh, who is providing the expertise, when you put them together, the result is more than the sum of its part, and that by definition is a synergy. Um, so it's something very important to consider as we're talking about NUA and uh, what Onset um, is also helping us do as a partner. Uh, next slide, please. And what I have up here, um, I'm focusing only on fruit production right now, just uh, in the interest of time and simplicity for this presentation. But um, we have, uh, as I said, over 40 different tools and resources available. Uh, to break it down for all the apple growers out there, uh, we have insect management models uh, that were developed by Cornell entomologists here. Uh, apple maggot, coddling moth, oblique banded leaf roller, oriental fruit moth, Plum Curculio, San Jose Scale, and Spotted Tendiform Leaf Miner. Um, these all work in slightly different ways. And uh, if you have an opportunity to interact with NUA in the off season, anybody can access this. It's open access. Um, you can go back in time. Um, so we don't have to look only at what's happening right now. If you want to become familiar with these, uh, you can select any one of these tools from any one of our weather station locations and start playing around with it. Um, and you'll see that as you proceed through a growing season, so if you go back to 2019, for example, at different points in time, you're going to get different management messages uh, based on, for example, the degree day accumulation in any of these insect models. Um, diseases are a little bit more complicated, but they work exactly the same way. Um, depending on what the risk factors are that the model is calculating, you're going to get different output messages um, that provide another data point. Um, in terms of basic weather data models and resources, we have a, a whole list of degree day summaries. So you select your start date and end date, and then your base temperature. Um, and this way, even if there's something that's not on NUA, um, 
but you know that, for example, uh, I want to track sweet corn development, um, you can still use something like an 8650 model and you have your own information. So we're trying to extend our reach as much as possible to provide support to you. We also have historical weather summaries. Right now, um, everything is summarized by month. Um, I mentioned briefly earlier that in November of this year, we are going to relaunch. So what you see on the website right now is going to be very different from what happens in November. And the reason I say this is because um, these monthly summaries that I'm pointing out are going to um, morph into a customized tool where you, again, specify the start date, end date, and then the type of record that you want, and you'll be able to download everything. So um, we've been doing a lot of uh, user experience research the past two years with our new estate coordinators. Um, we've been talking to growers, and I think we're really going to have a pretty awesome platform uh, that launches this November. So just something to keep an eye out for. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so uh, in this last, this is the last slide in my portion of this uh, piece of the webinar. So in this last slide, I just want to give you a visualization about what we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, I described it verbally just now, but if we use the example of coddling moth, um, it's a prevalent pest here in the Northeast and, and elsewhere. But what we want to do, uh, if we look at the life cycle on the right-hand side, is you know we have different life stages, but research tells us that there's a narrow window of control. And so in this case, we want to make whatever management decision is needed at a precise time. So I have control window highlighted, and that's what we're trying to do. But the way we do that is by tracking growing degree days. Um, Growing degree days are not a new concept, but what we're able to do because we have on-farm weather stations that are sending us information in almost real time is that on a daily basis for insects and sometimes on an hourly basis for diseases, we can give you the best estimate possible of when those periods of treatment should be. So you can see this synergistic effect that I've been talking about. Um, so I think at this point, I will hand this over to Matt Sharp, uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dan. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, this afternoon's webinar. My name is Matt Sharp, and my role here at Onset is to provide application support and consultation services for our Hobo weather stations. Next slide. So another poll question, uh, are you currently using data loggers? I'll give you just a few seconds to answer there. All right, just a few more seconds here. Now, these can be any type of data loggers. I can reach out to you afterwards. You could be using weather stations now, or Hobo standalone loggers, maybe even loggers that we've used long in the past. Maybe you've thrown in Tupperware and put out into the environment. And let's see. Okay, so. About 70%, it looks like, are, are not currently using any monitoring equipment in their application. So great. Thank you all. Next slide, please. All right, so a little background about Onsite. Uh, we were founded here on Cape Cod, uh, where we've been steadily growing as a world leader in data logging solutions for the past 39 years. Uh, all aspects of Hobo data loggers, from our research and development team, manufacturing operations, sales, and after-sales support is conducted here at our headquarters in Bourne, Massachusetts. Next slide. So why Onsite? Uh, just as Dan mentioned earlier about why NUA, I'll go into a couple uh, options or a couple highlights about Onsite. So our products are renowned for their reliability and research-grade performance at a cost less than major competitors. Uh, we have released a new weather station that combines the expected ruggedness and performance with an easier uh, to use design at a lower cost. The new logger, the, R the Micro RX, is a truly plug and play data logger. We're also excited about our HoboNet wireless sensors as an add on option for the Micro RX, as well as our RX3000 new weather station. These solutions provide you with an expansive mesh network of wireless sensors to monitor frost conditions or soil moisture throughout your fields orchards, and vineyards. I'll go over these options a little later in the webinar, but for now, uh, actually, we'll go over those right now. So 
So as I mentioned before, we have two different um, weather station platforms, the Micro RX and the RX3000. We actually have another question that we're going to ask in a couple slides, um, but let me go over some options now and we'll, we'll touch on those in just a second. So the two different, uh, two different targets for these weather stations are Micro RX, uh, I'm sorry, next slide please. Okay. Two different targets for, um, for our users. The Micro RX is a solution designed for smaller vineyards, uh, orchards, or farms, uh, or for users looking for the most cost-effective cost and easy-to-set-up option. The Micro RX can fully be deployed in as little as 30 minutes thanks to its compact and lightweight design and with the integrated solar panel. The RX 3000 uh, is for any size operation um, and is also very user-friendly to deploy. What sets the RX3000 apart from the Micro RX is the expansion and customizable features. Uh, these include Wi-Fi and Ethernet as options for communications, as well as the ability to include third-party analog sensors, relay modules for some basic uh, control functions, as well as an integrated water level and flow sensor for monitoring uh, if you have some irrigation monitoring that you're looking to perform there. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the shared features. Both solutions share many of the same features. Uh, both stations utilize the same smart sensor technology uh, so for plug and play uh, ease of use. Uh, smart sensors do not need to be calibrated or programmed. They simply plug into each respective unit and the, the station identifies the sensor type. Uh, all Hobo products are tested extensively for their intended environment to ensure that you're receiving a product that will stand up to the harshest of conditions. Uh, both products feature an integrated LC LCD panel on the inside of the data logger, and that lets the user know how many sensors are recognized by the station, battery levels, charging status, as well as the status of the last connection. Both data loggers push the collected data to Hobolink and NUA. Uh, Hobolink is on such cloud-based application where the user can set up and manage alarm functions, dashboards, as well as a nice map feature. Next slide, please. On the screen now, we're showing our micro uh, NUA station. Uh, this logger again, five plug-and-play sensors uh, for the required sensors for the NUA network. Uh, these sensors include a temperature and relative humidity combined sensor solar radiation, rainfall, wind speed and direction, and leaf wetness. Next slide. And on this slide, we're going to take an inside look of the Micro RX. Here, the LCD screen provides battery charge status and connection status. If there's an issue with your station, a fault code will display on the LCD screen, which will allow our technical support team to easily diagnose the air and get you back up and running quickly. You also notice the integrated mounting tabs on the top of the station, which allows you to use screws or zip ties or u bolts to easily attach this unit to a tripod or some existing structure that you currently have up. Next slide. In addition to the micro RX station, the RX3000 allows for connecting wireless sensors. So you can cover a wider area of your farm with a single station and get more detailed data on temperature, soil, and moisture within your field. Uh, we recently added the ability for our HoboNet sensors to be utilized on both the micro RX station as well as the RX3000. Um, so that really opens you up to ease of use and expandability when using that micro RX station. Um, additional options for the RX3000 include an analog module for connecting up to four third-party sensors. Uh, this module can also power those, those third-party sensors, which is important when you're looking for different sensors out there to use in your application. Uh, a relay module with three relays for basic actions, uh, which could be uh, configured off of a sensor alarm condition. Uh, there's a module for remote water level, uh, which was recently added, and that provides real-time monitoring of an irrigation reservoir height or irrigation canal water flow. And then the last module is the HoboNet Manager, um, and that is simply the receiver for the wireless sensors that I mentioned above. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this system is the RX3000. A little, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to go into our next poll question here. Uh, what size farm or vineyard or orchard are you looking to monitor? We'll give you all just a few moments on that. And based on the acreage, I can give you some recommendations here during the webinar of what station might work best for you. All right, we'll go ahead and close that poll. So it looks like half of you are using or, or have acreage up to 100 acres, uh, while 20% are over that 100 acre mark. So real, that's, a, that's a good mix there. So with this, um, you may find it easy to use a micro RX with the expandability of the HoboNet sensors as your easy solution for you know, uh, orchards or vineyards of this size. Uh, when you go into that 100 acres or more, you may be looking for something like an RX3000 to add a little bit more customized uh, features uh, to your monitoring needs there. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so another look on the inside of the RX3000. You'll notice that the LCD panel, very similar to what we saw on the micro RX, just a little bit different positioning there. Um, and then you also see, let's see the system for those who may need to add more sensors initially or later. So that's what those two modules in the front are for. Uh, these two expansion ports um, are easily plugged in. And again, you can, get, you can add an analog module, a relay module, a water level and flow sensor, um, as well as the HoboNet manager. So a lot of times what folks are doing, starting small with the, the basic newest setup, and then adding wireless sensors or those additional sensors at a later time once you, you know, you're going to realize the value of these stations as you go on. Uh, next slide, please. And again, once you have your RX3000 newest station or, like I said before, your micro RX, you can add up to 50 wireless sensors onto that station. Um, those wireless sensors can include temperature and relative humidity, soil temperature, soil moisture, wind speed and direction, rainfall, solar radiation and PAR, and those are all added again um, to that main station. Uh, another, some additional information about the HoboNet sensors. Uh, again, you can add up to 50 wireless sensors per RX3000 or micro RX. So either one of our newest station offerings, you can have up to, that, up to 50 wireless sensors in addition to those plug and play sensors I mentioned before. Uh, this system utilizes a 900 megahertz wireless mesh network. Um, that system is going to allow for long distances of 1,500 to 2,000 feet and it gets, does a pretty good job of getting through the vegetation as well. Uh, the system utilizes a mesh network, so the sensors you have in the field are actually going to work as, as dual sensors. They're going to have the sensing element, but they're also going to repeat uh, the information from nearby sensors back to your base station. Uh, each one of our HoboNet wireless sensors has a built-in solar panel, and inside there is a rechargeable battery um, so that's going to give you four to five years of battery life, hands off, no maintenance required. Um, and these sensors can be easily mounted to an existing pole, a trellis, uh, PVC is a very common one, zip tied, easily moved around during for farm operations. Next slide, please. So on your screen now is a HoboLink map view of a HoboNet field monitoring system installed at a local farm here in Cape Cod. This system is comprised, is comprised of 20 wireless temperature sensors, five soil moisture probes, and one wind speed and direction sensor. Uh, this type of system could be used to monitor your frost alerts, frost alerts at your orchard or vineyard. You also notice that these sensors are not only placed outside, but are also insta installed inside a high tunnel and several greenhouses on this property. Now, this is, image is a little bit cluttered, but in the right-hand side, kind of towards the center there, there's actually two greenhouses and two high tunnels. Uh, these sensors are inside, so you can see the, the full ability for the mesh network as an inside-outside uh, solution for your farm. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the important aspects of utilizing the HoboNet wireless sensors is for frost protection. Uh, cold temperatures at the wrong time of year coinciding with specific cycles of a crop can mean bad news for growers and their crops. Um, 
Most plants depend on cold temperatures to go through different plant cycles, and cold temperatures at the wrong time can lead to plant damage and crop loss. Um, frost risk is highest for early blooms. Um, early blooms represent the best and most lucrative parts of the berry crops, for example, because prices are highest early at the beginning of the season. Uh, alternatively, for late harvest fruits, cranberries and apples, late fall frost can disrupt entire harvest. So having a uh, wireless temp sensor in your orchard or vineyard can be very beneficial for you to protect your crops. Uh, our devices are being used for frost, frost prevention with wind machines in orchards and vineyards, irrigation and cranberry bogs and berry farms, and for protective covers for different vegetables. Next slide. And then for all of our applications for frost protection, uh, our temperature data loggers can be used to provide real-time alerts when temperatures drop below a user-defined threshold um, for a specified amount of time. When using wind machines, two temperature points are recommended, uh, one at canopy height and the other at about 30 feet. This is important to ensure there is no temperature inversion and that the air above the crop is higher than the air at the crop height. When used with irrigation, uh, temperature points are needed at the canopy or fruit height, and several points may be preferable to account for possible pockets of cold air. Um, because cold air is heavier than warmer air, cold air flows downhill like water and can collect in low-laying areas and around any obstructions such as walls or buildings that would impede airflow. So properly spacing out your, your wireless sensors uh, is important. And utilizing wireless sensors, you can kind of use a trial and error approach and, and ensure that you can get those sensors in the right place at the right time. And Dan, I'm gonna pass it back over to you to talk about linking with MUA, um, if you'd like to jump in here. Great, thanks Matt. <clears throat> um, so one of the important last steps, assuming that you purchase a unit, is uh, going through the workflow that we've established uh, to add your location onto the NUA platform. So the first question you want to ask yourself is whether you're in a NUA member state. Um, this is an important question because we work really uh, closely, again, with all of our state coordinators um, who, who either uh, pay through a grant of some sort or work with uh, state-level grower associations, actually, um, to pay an annual fee. Um, that fee is $1,750 right now. And what that does is it, co it helps subsidize the cost on NUA side of things. Um, this is independent from uh, the weather station vendor um, to help us support any grower and any commodity in that state if they want to add their own private weather station. So um, anybody who purchases an onset station, if you're in one of our 15 member states now, uh, and again, that includes Utah, um, beyond the cost of, of that initial capital per, uh, capital purchase, um, there is no other there's no other fee. Um, that leads to the next question, though, uh, of all those states that were highlighted in blue. So non-member states, if you're if you're a grower in one of those states, and maybe you don't have a big program um, that uh, supports apple production or grape production, you can still join. Um, several years ago, actually, just prior to my start we established a, a, a cost structure, again, to subsidize supporting, you know, the proper functioning of your weather station on the new platform. And so if you have one weather station and you're somewhere um, outside of our core network, it's $290 per year. Um, if you have more than one weather station, uh, it, the first one is 290 and the second one is $260. Um, and so you see how that works. Uh, what that does, the, those fees cover the cost of an online support desk, um, and I'll have that information on the next slide, but really to maintain a good experience, uh, we, we want to remove any pain points that, well, I, I reached out uh, to NUA, or I reached out to someone, and I haven't heard anything in three weeks, and my weather station's not working. We want to avoid that at all costs. So. If you, send, if you reach out to the new help desk, we're going to respond within a, one or two business days to let you know, hey, we got your message, you can easily solve this problem, or you need to reach out right away uh, to Onset, for example, and their, their technical support team can get you set up with something. So 
that's really what those costs cover. Um, the other thing I'll add at present is that when we relaunch the site, you're going to see what all of those uh, state membership fees and independent grower fees have been going towards because uh, we've actually earmarked everything the past year or two um, to really build a good user experience that is helpful to you as a grower. Um, the only other thing I'll add in terms of uh, working in a non-member state with NUA is that you really need to still look for that regional or local expertise because not all of our models are useful in all regions. Um, and the, the example I'll go back to is coddling moth. That was developed in the Northeast. When we get down into places like North Carolina um, or even Northern Tennessee, it, it just doesn't apply anymore because the life history is so different. Um, that said, one of the things we want to do after the, the uh, NUA is relaunched is as a medium term goal, perhaps pursue regional models. We're going to have the flexibility to do that um, once we get over this technology hurdle. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, I think a lot of the Apple management tools, the carbohydrate thinning model, are applicable widely. Um, but again, always look for that local expertise so that you can get as much information as possible. Um, I'm the technical person with new. I'm certainly not the person with the expertise on uh, the biological aspects of all these models. Um, as I said before, we have model developers who have done years and years of research on this, and they're the ones who inform the algorithms and the logic and stuff like that. Um, so again, just a, an important uh, disclaimer or uh, note to put out there. Um, so once let's let's say you've purchased your RX3000 or Micro RX. Um, the first step is to work directly with Onset. Um, we're partners, but we're independent partners. So you'll want to um, work with Matt or some other members of his team to link with Hobolink, uh, which is their platform. And then within that, um, you set up a data feed. Once that's done, that's the point you reach out to the new help desk and you say, hey, my data feed is established. Can we get onboarded, please? Um, so next slide. And everything, when I talk about the help desk, everything can be channeled through this email address up here. It's support at nua.zendesk.com. Um, this may change in a year or two, but for now, this is working really great. Um, I think in the past year and a half, we've fielded over 1,100 help desk tickets on a whole bunch of different topics. But by taking this approach, um, we're able to handle this and we're able to be responsive. So if nothing else, remember this email address. You can reach out at any time with questions. Uh, if it's something you're not sure about, uh, whether it's an onset or new question, I can always easily redirect. Um, and so don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Um, member states, uh, I'm going to put up a list in just a second, and there's a really good uh, related question that came up in the chat that I'll talk about. Um, and all other areas or states or regions, uh, just reach out directly uh, to me or one of my colleagues on the help desk and, and we'll get you information. Uh, next slide, please. Like I said, um, this is a complete listing of all of our NUA state coordinators. These are the people who um, make, really make NUA work and they're the ones who are responsible for what you see on that map. Um, NUA is not in the business of like being the one and only platform out there. Again, if I go back to what I pointed out earlier, we're growing organically, so to speak, um, tongue in cheek, but people are coming to us to make this work. Um, and what I, what I wanted to address here is that uh, we had a question about whether we're affiliated with EnviroWeather. Um, we, we are closely partnering with EnviroWeather at Michigan State University, in fact, all of the locations in Michigan you see right now are provided by EnviroWeather. Um, and I really like talking about this because I, I, I sometimes get looks of surprise or a reaction because they're like, well, aren't you competing? I think at this point in time, everybody is working really hard to find ways to complement each other. Um, and if I can go back to our website relaunch once more uh, before I conclude, what's going to happen on our new website is You'll see the NUA 
the newer logo or the newer wrapper, and you'll see certain features that are enabled. But if you visit a site that's provided by Michigan State University and Keith Mason at EnviroWeather, it's going to say this location is made possible by EnviroWeather. It's not going to be uh, Cornell plastered all over the website. Um, you know, in the footer, we're going to have uh, some recognition there. Uh, just because it's housed here, but we really are making an effort to regionalize the experience. And so um, it, the website more or less will detect um, what, what state you're in, and it's going to customize that experience for you. Um, so up here, I believe, yes, we have all 15 state coordinators uh, in the Northeast, Upper Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, and now Utah, um, who you can reach out to for more information. And I think with that, uh, I'm done with my portion uh, of the slide deck. Well, thank you, Dan and Matt. Uh, tremendous information for our audience. Uh, I'd like to open it up for uh, more questions at this time. To submit a question, please type it into the chat box in the bottom left corner of your screen. Some of the questions we'll address. Uh, there was a question about can you add a feature to monitor bitter pit, or I guess bitter rot was the specific question. So I'll, I'll answer that question. This is Dan. The way we develop models on NUA, again, uh, is with an expert in that field. So if you are having an issue with bitter rot, um, the way we would approach that is to, uh, and I'm not sure uh, where this person is based, um, but again, in the future, we could develop maybe a regional model for that. Or if it's something more universal, we could develop something over time uh, to address that. Um, that's the type of decision uh, that I don't make myself. I think it's made um, in context to what those needs are. So certainly, if you feel that bitter rot is becoming an issue, um, if you're in one of our member states, reach out to your state coordinator uh, to start that conversation. This is, a, this is a question probably for Matt. Do the wireless sensors need to be in line of sight of the master unit? Thanks, Matt. So the, the wireless sensors use the 900 megahertz mesh network. So it, the, the range of those sensors are 1,500 to 2,000 feet line of sight. But do keep in mind, to get around some of those light of, line of sight issues, the wireless sensors form a mesh network. And if we, can we actually go back to slide 24, please? I'm going to go back to the, the map slide here. And if you look in the upper, actually, let's look at the lower right hand, I guess the east side of the screen there. Uh, one of the soil moisture probes, uh, each one of these lines represents a path going back to the main station. So for whatever reason, the sensor on the right-hand side, the soil moisture probe, was unable to communicate back to the master unit, which is directly in the center of the screen. So it formed an alternative path down to the very bottom of the southern portion of the map here. Um, and those sensors actually picked up on that data and rerouted it back to the main station. So the farm that you're seeing here, these distances aren't, are not that great. Um, they're definitely below that 1,500 feet. But also keep in mind those redirects, it can have up to five jumps. So you can have your center station and then picture out the next sensor being 1,500 feet and then beyond that another sensor 1,500 feet up to five times. So you're really going to get an effective range of 7,500 to about 10,000 feet line of sight for this system. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and there's a very similar question. Uh, can wireless sensors see through vegetation and trees back to the RX-3000? Yes, thank you. Uh, and yes, uh, the, we found that the 900 megahertz system actually does a great job of getting through the vegetation. Um, there's a couple of good ways that you can actually get around some of those vegetation uh, issues as well. Uh, placing the, the hobo net uh, sensor itself uh, or the body as, as high as you can um, get to, to try to get that above the vegetation is, is one way around that. Another is adding a repeater either in line or as high as you can. Uh, we've found instances uh, in some pretty tough deployments, uh, especially out in Western Mass, where there was a large orchard 
um, with, with a lot of obstacles to, to work around. And what the users there did is they placed a uh, repeater unit actually on top of a barn to get a very high above the vegetation. And then the weather station itself was located a couple hundred uh, feet away from the barn. So it simply redirected all of the signals back down to the main weather station. So if you have any questions like that, I'd be very happy to have a conversation with you. A lot of times I'll use Google Maps or Google Earth to get kind of a lay of the land of your particular area, and we can design a system that really works for you. Uh, the next question uh, asks, uh, will the new, new uh, website remember the grower's biofix date so they don't have to re-enter them, always re-enter them? Yeah, this is Dan again. Um, the short answer is yes. So again, we've worked very hard to integrate a lot of uh, user features that are going to make Nua easier uh, to navigate and access. So one of those is a profile system. Um, we're always going to have, um, it's hard to describe without being able to show you the website yet, but we're always going to have like an open access uh, experience. So you can always go you, without having to provide any information at all. You'll always be able to access our models. However, if you want to do something like this where, yeah, it's really annoying to have to always re-enter biofix dates, You'll sign up for a very simple profile. It'll ask for your name and your email address. It's only so that we can create this profile. We will never share your information with anyone or, or sell it or share it to third parties. But by doing that, by having a profile, we can then save um, those biofix dates that you're asking about. So yes, that, the answer is yes. And will there be any degree day models for invasive pets, uh, pests such as spotted wing dystrophila or, or brown marmorated stink bug? So there is a large, I actually uh, just uh, submitted my own information for a large multi-state USDA proposal looking at spotted wing drosophila. So that, um, if it's funded, would look to build new resources. Again, this. Um, working closely with our partners in Michigan, actually, uh, to address this issue in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, so I would say medium term, probably maybe long term, that is a goal for spotted wing drosophila. Brown marmorated stink bug, and actually I saw another question about Japanese beetle. They're a little bit harder to predict uh, in terms of presence with a degree day model because um, if you think about, and it also depends on the life stage, um, but I think for those it might be a little bit more difficult or we might have to focus on a specific commodity. Um, I know there's some work that's been done in peaches, for example, um, looking at marmorated the stink bug, uh, but I would say more research needs to be done on those, those two insects. Okay. Uh, are you able to uh, connect the RX3000 to a third-party record-keeping system? You may have already addressed that. Um, thanks for the question. Um, that's probably a, a good question we could take offline. I, I'd like to get a little bit of information on that. Um, what you can do currently uh, very easily with the RX3000 and, and the data in Hobolink is have the data automatically emailed to you uh, or put into some sort of FTP uh, type format to where that data is automatically sent to you so you could be upgrading or updating your own databases. Uh, we also offer API. At, there's no extra charge for that. So if you want to develop your own uh, software method of, of pooling data from, from Hobolink and actually import that into your own software, that's, that's a possibility as well. Um, but I can follow up more with that particular question specifics offline. This is a pretty specific one about uh, where is the best strategy for placement of leaf wetness sensors to represent the vineyard? So yeah, so there are guides, um, and Dan, you might want to jump in here on this one as well. There are guides set up on the new website of where sensor location should be. Um, keep in mind that for the onset, offering, we do have both wired and wireless sensors. And leaf wetness is also a wireless sensor. So that could be placed at, it, at any height um, that you really needed it to um, from, a, from a physical standpoint. 
from what you're going to get on the uh, on the NUA impact of that, I'll let Dan cover that, or we can take that question offline as well. Yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to answer that question. Um, you know, I've had a little bit of experience uh, the past season working with this wireless mesh technology, and one of the interesting things is that you can put it out, and that's not the end all to where it's going to go. Like if you say, okay, I'm willing to invest in two or three of these, but I'm not exactly sure where the best location is. Like here in, uh, where I'm based in the Finger Lakes, maybe we're on a steep slope and the top of my vineyard has very different conditions than the bottom of my vineyard. You could start out by placing them uniformly and then look at the data and say, well, there's not a lot of difference, but I seem to have one cold spot like in the bottom northeast corner or something. I'm going to move two of my sensors down there and see what happens. So I f my personal feeling is that this type of mesh technology is very flexible in a lot of different situations. Um, so, but there's no, there's no official um, recommendation. Um, that's just my own personal experiment. Good. Uh, this is another uh, Envio weather related uh, question about uh, uh, let me see here. Boy, we're, they're coming in, so I'm starting to lose my track here. Um, uh, th let's just throw out an easy one. Does this technology have any application in the cranberry industry? Maybe not so easy. <laughs> well, uh, uh, no, this is this is Dan. I think you know with a lot with a lot of the models that are on NUA. Um, we're working with the same basic parameters, but it really just depends on um, how we are applying them. You know, what is, what is the calculus that we're using, or what is the logic that we're applying to those parameters, or what is, what is that calculation or risk value that we're coming out with. So um, one thing that comes to mind is cranberry fruit worm. Um, I think we're still, in terms of a release, we're still at a medium term uh, with that, but I know, I mean, the same principles apply. So to answer the question of whether it's useful in a cranberry production setting, I think it just depends on like what the expertise is out there. And um, maybe there's even some innovation um, on the part of growers. Maybe it's just some basic temperatures. Uh, you know, there were, uh, I think, Matt, I think you mentioned, like, water gauge uh, sensor availability. You know, maybe you're monitoring the water temperature or something. I'm, I'm not an expert, but I'm just kind of, like, putting these ideas out there um, uh, to kind of generate some thought. So I, don't, I don't know if that answers the question. Okay. Well, we're going to be wrapping up the Q&A in a couple of minutes. Uh, we can just answer a couple of more quick questions and... Uh, obviously, you folks can follow up with, uh, with some of these questions uh, offline. Um, the, how do you determine how many sensors you need per weather station? So, so yeah, I can, I can help out with that. So, yep. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, no, I was just going to point out that we have a standard configuration for the base station. Um, and so those are... Uh, Matt, those are pre-configured, right? So that cost includes all the basic sensors uh, that would be needed that, for new. Uh... That is correct. The most sensors are temperature, relative humidity, uh, rainfall, wind speed and direction, solar radiation, and leaf wetness. Um, from there, uh, if you have questions, if you're wanting to monitor, monitor some additional aspects of your vineyard or your orchard, um, Give me a call, and we can go over your specific uh, your specific plot there and figure out you know the best strategy. Do you need to monitor for you know frost conditions, or do you have some you know are, are you trying to fine tune your irrigation system and you want to you know throw in some soil moisture probes in different areas, um, even wireless uh, wind speed and direction sensors if you're worried about or need to. Uh, keep a record of wind condition when you're doing some spray applications. That's also very important, especially if you have one of those larger, uh, larger orchards or if you have some, you know, geographical uh, changes throughout, you know, throughout your property. So a lot of times conditions on one side are not the same as conditions on the other side. So 
Um, we kind of take those as a case by case, and we can go through and start with a basic NUA system and expand that as you need it. And you can expand to one wireless sensor or up to 50. So it's really dependent on your needs. Good. Uh, one quick, quick one. Uh, does onset charge recurring fees for the devices? So we do not charge for the devices themselves. We have uh, so there's two differences on the data loggers themselves. The micro RX is a cellular based data logger. So obviously that's going to have an annual cellular fee. Um, those data plans start at $150 per year, um, and that's really all you would need for your basic NUA system. Um, if you wanted to beef that NUA system up and have you know 50 wireless frost and soil moisture probes, uh, the cost for that would be $350 annually. Um, if you have Ethernet or Wi-Fi reliably available on your orchard or vineyard, you can utilize the RX3000, and the benefit of that is there is no additional annual fees for the sensors or access to HoboLink. So at any time, you can access your data uh, to HoboLink and, and, and see, that, see the information that's currently on, uh, on farm. Um, one restriction there on the cellular, the lower you cellular plan is the ability, the notifications. You're limited to, I believe, 25 alarms per month on the lowest use plan. Great. Well, that's about all we have time for today. We want to thank you again, uh, our wonderful presenters, for and all who have participated today. Uh, please keep an eye out for future webinars uh, from Fruit Growers News via our email list, and our social media platforms. And with that, I'll say good day and thank you for joining us.